just a practical question. Okay. Back all locations. Uh, uh, Thank you. It's the last day. Now, I'm a bit nervous because I still have a lot to share, but I'll share the most important things. The other things you can research by yourself. So, of course, I'll appreciate your questions. Uh, if you want to know something more than what I say, then you have to ask me. Because uh, I'll just give you the, the main things which I think will help you. And the other things you have to research. I'll give you the main things and the inspiration so that you can go and research more. Okay, so yesterday we've been looking at the personal development, which is uh, the building blocks. If you understand your identity, you will be able to live your calling. If you don't understand your identity, you cannot live your calling. So we look at Jesus, the Son of God, that where did his identity come from? Was it from the earth, from God the Father? So according to Matthew chapter number three, we discovered that there was a, a, a voice, audible voice from heaven that spoke and say, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. Then we fast forward to us through the later of Paul, the writings of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, that Paul dealt with this issue of identity and calling in a deeper way, whereby he made sure that the first thing for the Ephesians now apply to us to understand it's about our identity, that you are chosen, you have been redeemed, you have an inheritance, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And when you are secured that you are not an accident, God has a purpose for your life, and he, you are here for a mission, it's when you can live in your call. And then we looked at some other aspects of personal growth, personal development, and uh, today we are continuing looking at now the bigger picture of development. We start with personal development, and now let's look at the world at large, how do they approach development works. So that's what we are doing today. So I begin today with a secular view of development versus the biblical view of development. What is the difference? And how do we approach uh, uh, development? So according to the Australian Institute of Family Studies, they define community development as community development is a process where community members are supported by agencies to identify and take collective action on issues which are important to them. So that's secular view. It's supported by what agencies? Community development is supporting the community to the issue that uh, the community is facing so that the community can take Corrective, corrective actions towards that. But listen to uh, the words. Li see uh, what is important in this in this sentence. It says, it is a process where community members are supported. So can you see there? The word supported, mm -hmm. it shows already a problem that it's uh, you are dependent on somebody to support you. Okay? So you cannot move forward if the support does not come. So if you have written a proposal, you have not yet received the answer, you'll be waiting, waiting, sitting back, waiting for the agencies to support you for the issues which are important for your community. Can you, can you see that? This issue is important for your community, but you're waiting for the agent. Uh, you're waiting for the international agencies to support you, okay? So that's the secular view. Now, what is the biblical view? The biblical view we define community development as the process of moving people and communities from where they are towards God's intentions. You move people, 
you move the communities from where they are, where are you? And then you start moving them to, towards God's intention. You remember, if you go back to Genesis, the first ever development uh, uh, action that was happened in history was God himself when Adam and sin fell into sin. Okay? When Adam and Eve, they fell into sin, Adam was the first development worker that he had come to them. And how did he start? He asked Adam, Adam, where are you? Okay? Where are you? Because he wanted to start moving Adam and Eve from where they are towards God's perspective, towards God's intention. So now, the biblical view of development, it's the process of moving people from where are they in their, in their stage of life, where the community are at, you begin to move them, you work with them towards God's intention. That is biblical perspective on development. So let's continue. Okay, so what is the protocol of entering the community? If you agree that community development, it's the process of moving people, communities from where they are towards God's intention. So they need to be a protocol. You cannot just do anyhow. There need to be a way how you can enter the community, how you approach the community, how you start the movement. So what have you learned about community development? So the, the first thing that is the attitude, okay? The attitude of going into the community is very important. You need to get to know the community. As we say, that it's the process of moving people from where they are. So that means you need a research. You need to know where are they, what are the issues. So your attitude can help to bring development or to destroy or to, to hinder development. So we have tips, say, Humility, humility, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Okay, that's First Corinthians eight, verse number one. So, what are the most basic questions that you need to ask in the community when you're going? Okay, you are in the process of getting to know this community to get to know where are the people. Okay, you understand? You want to know where are they so that then you can develop your strategy to start moving this community from where they are towards God's intention. So the first, uh, the first question that you need to ask is what do the people already know and have? What do the people already know and have? Because you cannot come to a community which is ignorant, they don't know, they know nothing, you know, they have nothing. It's not possible. These people, you have to remember that they have been surviving before you actually get there. Okay? You are not, you are not the savior. You are not Jesus. Eh? So you are coming there <laughs> to facilitate, you know, development. But these people, they have been surviving. They have been living there. Eh? So you have to ask, what do they know? What do they have? And that's what we call in community development, the quote, resource assessment. You're making an assessment. It's a, it's a research, you know. You're making a, uh, an assessment. What, do, what knowledge do they have, okay? Okay? What resources do they have? Remember this uh, development pyramid that we have? Huh? The, what resources do they have? What knowledge do they have, okay? And where did they get this knowledge from, okay? And uh, what do they have the things that can help this area to develop like the way god did to adam and eve he said where are you and he said oh, we are here we are hiding we are hiding we are naked we are in fear and god said okay he had to check about their knowledge he said who told you that you're naked you know <laughs> who told you he wanted to confront that worldview that understanding who told you the source of information who told you that you cannot develop in this community? So he is just asking questions, you know, you know. And the other question was, have you eaten? You know, God was really having conversation 
with these people. He was not giving answers yet, but he was giving them, you know, things to think about, about the, where are they, the resources, knowledge, where do they get their knowledge from, and the, who taught them, you know, things like that, you know, what did they do practically, so that he can start to, to bring that transformation. That's the first question. That's what we call resource assessment. You are checking about the resources that they have. The pyramid, we said the foundation for development from basic to complex, from villages to big nations, the foundation, it always starts with what? Resources. Are we together? Mm -hmm. So here, the first question that we have, it's about the resources. Okay? What do the people already know and how? The second question is about what is preventing them from moving forward. So that's what we call needs assessment, okay? If they have all these resources, if they have all this knowledge in the community, what is preventing them from moving forward? Because there has to be some blocks, eh? road blocks. There have to be some hindrances. It has to be like maybe some negative experience that these people have undergone that is preventing them from moving forward, from where they are towards the desired goal. So here we say you need to have big ears, you need to listen a lot. Uh, you, you have to have big eyes, you need to see, observe, go around and observe in the community, you see where do they get water and all these things. And uh, you have big ears, you need to listen a lot, and then you have to have little mouth. <laughs> Little mouth. Some people they talk too much. Eh? Talk too much, dominating. They just come new, they don't even know the culture, they don't know the language, they don't know the people, but just talk too much. No. Big eyes. Observe the community. Big ears, hear the stories, okay? And the little mouth. Even in the Bible, that's what James is telling us, that we should be quick to what? to listen and slow to speak. Hmm? So when you are entering to the community, you go there as a baby, okay? You're going there to learn, okay? You're not going at, uh, you're not going at first to teach. You're going to learn, okay? Be a baby, Be, get born in the culture hear their stories, okay, observe, see things from their perspective. That's why when Jesus was, there, uh, was born, I mean, being the savior of the whole world, he didn't just come a grown-up man, okay? He could come a grown-up man and say, hey, I'm the savior of the world. You know, you know, everybody listen to me. <laughs> but, he, but he didn't do that. He was born in a manger. Hmm? born like a baby and grow in the culture for 30 years. Okay. Why? Why, why is the God of the whole universe, you know, becoming a baby and grow in the culture for 30 years and then did his ministry for three and a half years and it was effective until today we are here. Because he took time to learn, to observe things, okay? not just quick to, to, to answer and criticize. You remember when he was at, uh, at the age of 12, he, he went to, to the temple. He was, I mean, he was asking the, the teachers of the law, he was asking questions, you know? you know? You think as Almighty God, he didn't know. So these are the things that we need to consider when you are going into a new community, when we want to start a project, when we want to do any type of work, we need to go there as listeners and learners, as students, before we are teachers. Because if you go as a student and a learner, it will help you to have a big understanding so 
the more you understand, the more your ministry will have on you. Okay. But if you come with big, big mouth, you talk a lot, people will just listen. And they say, <laughs> They will just listen and some cultures they're too timid, they cannot disagree with you. They just they, they just uh, they just uh, agree, but they know it cannot work, <laughs> and then you can you cannot predict the development. There is a, a British uh, missionary, he happened to be my friend, he came from Malawi and he was living in a in a township we call it in the, in the land. So he was a nurse. Eh? He was a nurse and a missionary, so he used to have Bible study. People were coming, you know, in his house and he shares tea with them, biscuit, cookies, they were coming. And then he was teaching them to wash their hands. He said, as nurse, you know, you know, you need to wash your hands as part of development. Yeah? You know, you have to wash your hands always so that when you are eating, uh, you you have clean hands because uh, there are some germs in your hands that you can put in the food, it will make you sick. Yeah? So as long as he was there, people they were washing hands, coming to his Bible study, they drink tea, they, they left, uh, they left to go to their house. And then this missionary went back to the UK for holiday. So when he came back, do you think people, they, are, they were still washing hands? Were they washing hands? No. <laughs> they stopped. <laughs> they were not washing hands. So this missionary was angry, you know. They said, why? You, you, you came to me, I teach you how, how important they have to wash hands. Because if you don't wash your hands, you know, you'll get sick, you know. And then they, start, they started laughing and said, do you really want to know what makes people sick? And they say, yeah, I want to. To, to hear, he said, it's not actually the germs, it's not the washing hands that you're talking about. But in the night, the witches, wizards, they fly around the houses, spirits. That's what causes people to be sick. So I said, but why, when we, I was here, you were washing hands and you were coming to my house? He said, because you are giving us tea, you know? <laughs> 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 because you are giving us tea and some biscuits. So, this is the problem when you go into the community and you have a big mouth. <laughs> you big mouth, you speak, and people they just okay, okay, okay. But they know it will not work. <laughs> they, they really understand that what you are telling them not move them. But if you go with big eyes to observe, and then with big ears, you hear, you hear the stories, then you know what you are doing. Okay, and then you begin to challenge those assumptions, and it's when you can see the problem. Are you together? Yes. Okay, so key elements for sustainability. The story I've just told you, it's a, you can see that what he initiated, what he was telling the community, they could not sustain it could not continue, they could only do as long as he's there, okay? So that means there is no sustainability, okay? So what are the key elements? If you want to build a project, you want to do something that will be sustainable. Sustainability, that means it continues even after you left, even after you are dead, something has to continue going, okay? So number one, it has to be cultural, culturally acceptable. They have to accept it in their culture, okay? So you have whatever knowledge, whatever ideas that you have, you have to translate it in their culture. That's why cultural studies is very, very important, okay? In, in the DTS, I remember during our time, whenever you are going to outreach, they were preparing you. We had, we had the two days or three days of cultural studies. You start about the culture where you go. You immerse yourself, you put yourself in the shoes of this country. Why? Because you want to put that gospel, whatever you want to do, in the cultural context of that people. Okay? So, it has to be culturally acceptable. 
acceptable. Acceptable. I'm challenged with this word. Acceptable. Actually, acceptable. And number two, it has to be locally available. Whatever you do, whatever you bring, they should be, it should be available in the local market. Because if you bring things, high-tech things, and you are trying to bring development, if it breaks, they cannot repair. They cannot find the, the parts for that things. Then you will introduce people to something that cannot continue. So that one, it's not sustainable because you're bringing something that people cannot repair. They cannot find it in a local market. If you want to bring something and it's a new product, then also organize a, a market. Make a shop where people can find this, the parts of these things, of the new technology that you're bringing. It was good. Yesterday we visited the farm there. High-tech machines, mm -hmm. combined harvesters, big tractors and all these things, you know. But <laughs> if you take that one and bring it to Malawi or to your country or somewhere else, you know, it will just work as long as it functions, the machine. But when it breaks, who can fix it, number one? <laughs> who fixes fix this machine? <laughs> number two, <clears throat> it's not locally available. So it's not sustainable. Okay, it's not, it's a good thing, but it's not what? Sustainable. Not all good things are sustainable. Okay, that's the lesson you have to take. Not all good things are what? Sustainable. Mm -hmm. There are some things they cannot be good, but they are sustainable. I'm not saying that having big machines like that, it's a problem. No, here in Switzerland, it's perfect fine. Yeah? It's, it, it's a first world, you know. They have, mm. himself is a technician, he can fix the machines, he can do this. But if you take it, I don't know, in Moldova, you, do you have tractors like those ones in Moldova? No. Okay. Yeah. So that's the point I am making that that means you see that Moldova or Africa or other parts of the world, we are still behind. Okay? So if you are to go as a development worker, you need to have that understanding that there are some things that you need to adapt so that they can be culturally accepted and also they are locally available. And the fourth point is about affordable. Can people pay for it? The development you're bringing, can people pay for it with their level of income and what they are doing? Can they pay for it? If they cannot pay for it, don't bring it. Because it will bring problems. And uh, I gave uh, an example. I was talking to somebody, I think, over lunch. He was talking about aquaponics. You know, when I showed about my the, the fish ponds that I made in jail. So he said, do you know about our aquaponics? It's a cool system. I said, yeah, it's a, yes, it's a cool system. I, I, I was trained in that. I know how to build it. And I, I, I built some. But uh, when I thought about Malawi and my community, I thought it's not affordable because it depends on the heavily on electricity. And in Malawi, we don't have all this reliable electricity. You will have time to work out. So the, at the aquaponics, you need to connect the pump, but all this, in the water need to be circulating. The, the level of, 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 of bacterial activities in the water has to be perfect, you know? Otherwise, if you don't circulate, the fish will die. So it's, it really needs, it's complicated. So think of in the village, they don't have electricity number one. They use the uh, other source of light. And uh, if they can try, they need solar. 
to, to connect to the system, but this solar is expensive, it's money, cannot, cannot work, it's not affordable for the people. So the development that you're bringing has to be affordable. So if I bring this kind of technology, the aquaponics, uh, people say he is affording it because he has money. Because he has money. So it has already defeated the purpose of what you want to do. Because if they have this mindset that ah, he's doing that because he has money, then they'll say, I don't have money. I don't have to do it. You see, that's the logic. That's the logic behind it. But if you do the simple things like digging the, the, the pond from the ground, they know everybody as a whole can dig that one. They can mold the bricks, you know, they can dig the well. And this one, they can afford. They can, they can multiply. So that's the, the goal when we're talking about uh, <clears throat> development, that it has to be culturally acceptable, locally available, and affordable. If you miss these three important factors, then you bring knowledge and some ideas, but not development. Because development, we say, it's moving with the people from where they are, we bring them towards God's intentions. Okay? If you miss these three points, then you are a secular development worker because you are just bringing, you are an agent who is coming to support the, the, the community uh, for their needs. And uh, this has, has problems, has, has challenges. As we go, I'm going to show you some of the challenges. Okay. I'm moving a little bit. We are moving from where we are now. I want to continue. <clears throat> so in development, we have terms that we normally use, the language. Remember I said that you, you have for special type of groupings, ethanols, but you have people with different languages. So in also development, there are some languages that they speak. And uh, this is what we call relief versus development. Relief de versus development. Then I'll try to explain these terms to, to you so that you can understand. So depending on your definition of poverty, it will determine how you will deal with the question of poverty, how you alleviate it. So there are three steps that people, they take when it comes to development. So the first step is what we call relief. And the second step is rehabilitation. And the, the third step is development. So it's compared, the relief is compared to somebody, a person, a human being who is walking straight, like the way you see on the picture, that he is walking straight, everything is going fine. And then you see there is a ditch. So he fell in the ditch, something happened to this person. And the person is in trouble. He cannot help himself. Without your help, the person might die, okay? The person might die. So during that time, the person need relief, okay? Because he's in trouble, he's in a situation that he cannot help himself. So it's like, it's, you can compare it with somebody who is having a wound, a serious wound, he cut himself, maybe an artery or what, and he's losing blood. So you want to stop the bleeding. That's the heat, okay? Because you want to stop what? The bleeding. But after you stop the bleeding, you come to the second step, rehabilitation. That's to help the person to walk again or to be well again after a disaster. And then when the person is, no, is good again, he can develop. He will become better than before because now he has experience of the catastrophe or the trouble that he had and has recovered from that. So that's, that's uh, the terms that they use. But the problem is how to switch 
from one state to another. And this has created dependency, has created a lot of problems with nations because they thought, okay, now these people, we need to try to help them. They're in, they're in trouble, but then they continue the relief for a long time without switching to rehabilitation or to development and it creates dependence. Are we together? You remember the story that we did yesterday, how to help the community? That your help should not create dependence, okay? Your help should cultivate hard work. But in a relief situation, if you're not careful, you see that uh, you create a culture of, you know, of depending and the lazy people that, that really, you know, they just depend on you and you become a god to them. Okay, so let's read this story from the Bible that we can read the principles a bit and then we'll continue. Can somebody read Luke chapter number 10, verse 25 to 36? Luke chapter number 10, verse 25 to 36. Who's ready to read? Ezra, are you there? Uh, Luke chapter 10, 25 to 36. Yeah. A parable of a good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on, on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sat him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think? Proved to be a neighbor to a man who fell among the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. All right. Uh, it's a simple story about the Samaritan, the good Samaritan. But it teaches us principles on, on what we are talking about. Relief, rehabilitation and development. Okay. And... Uh, the Samaritan and the Jews they were not good friends. They were they were at an enmity. But this story is just telling that a certain Jewish man moved from Jerusalem when, you know, to Jericho. So we, we don't know why he was traveling that part. We don't we don't know he's not explaining, but he want to make the point. So he said he fell into the hands of robbers. So the most important point that I want you to see from there is he was beaten and he was what? Half dead. Okay, you see that picture? He's walking and then he fell into the hands of the robbers. He was half dead. That means when somebody is half dead, it means he cannot help himself. Okay? He needs somebody to help him. So then there are two people who just pass by and look at him and say, it's none of my business. They might have good reason because one is a priest and like, right? they were told not to touch blood. Maybe they're going to, to offer sacrifice in the temple. So 
You cannot rule them out saying, oh, they were bad people. You know, you know, maybe they're following the laws. But the point is that this guy, this, this guy who fell into the hands of the robbers, he needed relief. Okay? Because without that relief, the, the passage is saying that he was half dead. He could have died. Without the help of the Samaritan, this man could have died. Okay? So that's relief. Relief we give to people that without our assistance, they will what? Die. So look, when he helped them, he said he took him, he cleaned the wounds, he bandaged him, and put some things, and he put him on his animals. Okay? That is, uh, now he stopped the breathing. He's taking him to a safe place. You know? Uh, in our modern day, we say, he take him to the hospital. You have first aiders and paramedics, and you are bringing him to what? <laughs> to hospitals. To a hospital. So, so when he was there, that that process, what we call rehabilitation, okay, it's the time to heal, to restore, to recover, okay, this person, okay. And now look at the Samaritan when he was there at the inn. What did he do? He gave the money, and he continued with his journey. He left this person in the hands of experts, okay. Whatever more you spend on this person. I will pay back, but he didn't stay there. Okay, he didn't stay there, continuing to be to be there. You know, so he left. Okay, and then he left it in the hands of expert who can take, who can give proper care on that one. So that's the steps of development. Relief you give to a person who is about to die, without your support, they cannot uh, live. And rehabilitation, you are training them how to walk again, to heal and to restore them, okay? And then you have to know when to leave. You have to leave. You don't have to stay there, you have to leave, you have to stop. And then when they are well, they will even develop further. Because you see, this person, do you think next time he will take that road when he wants to travel? He will remember that he felt in the hands of lovers. Even if you're going to take the same road, then at least you have security. You're not going to be alone because now he is alone. That's development. He become wiser. He's more experienced. He knows this way is dangerous. Okay, so that's development. You want to make people better than before, not dependent. Right together. So your help should uh, prepare people to be better than before. You have to leave people better than the way you find them. Okay? You have to leave your village or your community better than you find it. But if you leave the community uh, worse than before, then it's not development. You know? So, so that's, that, that, that's the thing. You have, your, help should, your help or your teaching should make your people more clever, more, more, more smart, <laughs> better and, uh, and, than before, the way you find them. So that's, uh, that's the story. So the leaf, I'm just adding, it's like you see here, there's a flood. So the waters come, you know, everywhere and people, they're drowning. So the leaf said, quick, the people in the helicopter they said, quick, let's save those drowning people. We can worry about why they were living in cardboard houses later, you see. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the people are drowning. When people, they're in trouble, it's not the time to question, you know, it's, uh, why is this, what, what, you go and you save them. And then you can discuss later when they are on a good position, why did you build not safe house? And why this and what? So that relief is uh, something that needs to be done quickly. It's an emergency situation. Immediate, immediate help. Immediate, immediate help. Okay. So now relief versus development is a, immediate assistance provided to people affected by a crisis or a disaster, mm -hmm. such as food, shelter, and medical care. It focuses on meeting the basic needs of people in a crisis and providing emergency assistance to help them survive. So you are just helping them to what? Survive. Relief efforts, they are typically short term, and focus on meeting immediate help.
While as development, it's long-term process of improving, improving the economic, social, and political conditions of the community. So development, it's a, it's a long term okay, process. You plan about development to improve the economic, the social, how people relate to one another, and the political condition of a community or country. So uh, development needs proper plan than the relief. You know? Relief, you can just write a, hey, newsletter, hey, an earthquake has happened in this place. Who want to give? You know? But not so with development. You need to plan well. Mm. Development focuses on building sustainable systems and structures that can help improve their lives over a long term. Initiatives such as education, health care, infrastructure development, and economy. So you have bigger agendas, and you want to help people in a long term, okay? That even long after you are dead, you are gone, people will still survive. So you do things that don't just exist when you are still alive, but you do things that, that will outlive you, okay? That's development. That, that was uh, my passion when I did the World View School and did community development, uh, community development and sustainable school. I said, I, want, I don't want to do just projects that they happen in my life's time. But I want to do things that they impact generations yet to come. People yet unborn, they should still benefit to what I have, we are doing now. So that's why we have a hospital. I will die, the hospital will still continue. Eh? We have the school, the primary school. I will die, the school will continue. Eh? The secondary school, I will die, the school will continue. Eh? It will continue to educate people who are yet unborn. So that's that's a development that you, you need to aim at, you know. So that's what uh, we can say relief versus development. So now, we have uh, two scenarios that we need to talk about. Mm. Scenario number one, it's uh, how do you rebuild Ukraine? Okay. Now we have learned about community development principles and what to do, not giving enough food for you to think about. So where do you start if you were to rebuild your claim? What would you look for? So it's a discussion for, for 10 minutes. And um, number two, it's scenario two is Gaza. Your development workers now. Eh? So we are sending you to Ukraine, some will go to Ukraine, some will go to Gaza, to rebuild Gaza, some to rebuild Ukraine. So the way we do, um, I just want to, to progress. So we'll say Malawi will discuss, will tell us how they're going to rebuild Ukraine, and then uh, Abuja and Ibada, they will discuss how they are going to rebuild Gaza. Keep those ones because I want to continue up to, to 11 and then I, I give another one to Switzerland. Okay, So that we have for different locations, we have things to discuss, then we can share. Then in the end, it will help us to learn more rather than that all of us will discuss the same thing. Are we together? Mm -hmm. So keep uh, scenario number one uh, and scenario number two. You, you have heard me what I said. Please just write these scenarios. I'll come back to it. But we want to continue now a little bit. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's continue. Okay. Biblical development. 
How do you develop Biblical? What do you look for? If you go into the community, if you go to the nations, what are the indicators that you can say, this nation, this community is developed. This one, it's not developed. Okay? So there has to be indicators. As uh, community development workers, there has to be indicators. <clears throat> so, in the book, Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2, verse number 52, it gives us a model of development. It talks about Jesus. Okay? It talks about Jesus. Can somebody just read that one? Luke 2, verse 52. Luke 2, verse 52. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom. Luke and in start up, and in favor with God and man. Christian, Christian in stature, in favor with God and men. Okay. Okay, the scripture say Jesus increased. The other translation say Jesus grow. He was growing. Okay. Sometimes it's quite shocking to think that the man of the son of God, God himself, he was growing. Okay. Because people, many people, they just think he just came. You know, on our end, but he say he was growing. There was a process of growing. So each and every person undergoes the process of growing. Each and every community and nation undergoes the process of growing. So which areas does Luke suggest that Jesus was growing? So he said, number one, he was growing in stature. That's physical development. Okay? physical development so you look at the physical development of the community physical development of the area that you're doing how are they doing what about recycling what about this, the cleanness what about how they're dealing with the environment all these things these are physical development in this scripture it was about jesus growth about the body but in our application as we are studying we look at the physical development of the country how are they doing okay that's the indicators for growth indicators for development number two is social development how do people relate in that community is that safe can you go into the street in the at night and how is the security of the country how are the household relating can you do business can you trust one another that's social development are you together social development and you see that jesus was also growing socially when they forgot him at the temple in Jerusalem, what did the parents thought the whole day walking and without being uh, noticing that they don't have their son? They said they thought he was among his what? His peers. Okay? So he had good relationship with friends that the parents could not worry about. You know, you know? they thought ah, he's just socializing. You know? So social development. Are you a social person? Can you relate with other people? Because some of the challenges and the problems of people uh, that people or communities have is just broken relationship. They don't relate well with other people. Okay? I always say, if you, uh, let's say, Catherine doesn't have food, I have food. And then our relationship, our social relationship is not good. You know, that we had problems. We didn't solve that. She would go to bed with empty stomach, not because there's no food, but because we have broken the relationship. Okay? Because if we could have good relationship, she could come and talk to me and could give her food. Okay? So that's, that's social development, that some of the problems that people have, the answers of those problems, they're in the hands of other fair women. Mm -hmm. But because of broken relationship, they cannot have it so you look you check for that in the data. so you look at the third aspect you look at the spiritual growth at these nations at this community are they growing spiritually what is their relationship with god you know do you have churches people do they worship and what is happening in that because you know that the causes of poverty is holistic it's not just material thing Poverty is not a, an issue of just a lack of material things. It has a dimension to its causes, which is, you know, 
Spiritual is part of it. We talked, we talked about it. So is the community growing spiritually? If they are not growing spiritually, even if you can provide the material things, there will be still poverty because then things are not going to work out. So make programs that can help the community to grow spiritually. Okay? That's the indicator. And then in the area of wisdom, is the community growing in wisdom? Talk of school and you know their knowledge of God and other things, the resources, how can they turn the resources into wealth? That's the, the wisdom. And then you hear that Jesus was growing in all these areas. How do we know that? When he was at 12, the age of 12, he went to Jerusalem. And what did he do? He was discussing with the teachers of the law. These were the elite of his time. Yeah? These were the, the, the top, the genius, you know, that, 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 that ever lived during Jesus' time. And then uh, I heard uh, Vishal Marwalani said, probably, this is, I mean, like, what, that's what Vishal said. Probably Jesus went to the smaller synagogues of his village, and then he was asking, <laughs> you know, the questions there about the law and other things then they could not give him good answers. So he said, okay, next year when I go to Jerusalem, I'll ask the teachers, I'll ask the experts what they'll say, you know. So he went to Jerusalem and he was discussing with these teachers of the law the question about understanding of God and religions and all this kind of thing. What was happening? Growing in wisdom. So we need these four areas as our indicators for growth. So now, this is now the exercise for Switzerland. We write the questions and then we go for five minutes stretch break. And during the break, you have to discuss scenario one, scenario two, under this question, so that when you come back after five minutes, we can share, then we continue. Are we together? So for now, for Switzerland is here, we said Jesus was grown from Luke 2, verse 52. But I want you to tell me, to, to discuss, what was the political situation during Jesus' time? Can you tell me what was the situation politically? Was it a good political system? Was it a time of peace or when he was growing up? What do you think about it? How did he manage to grow in his political environment? Okay. And the second question is, what was the religious situation? You think he had a perfect religious systems that was going on during his time that helped him to grow? And what about, what was Jesus' family situation? Was he coming from a poor, rich family or what? And how did it help him to grow? So then you share this as Switzerland and uh, Malawi scenario one about the building Ukraine Abuja and the Ibada scenario two about the building Gaza, and then we'll share after break. Okay, you say five minutes break. Eh? Are you going to put five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel good. So quickly, is Marai there? Malawi, are you back? Abuja. And Ibada, are you back? Yes, we are back here, Mala, we are back. Okay, so can you tell us your insight? How are you going to build Ukraine for us? Uh, you have a few minutes to do that, and then after that, Imbada or Abuja. You have to to share your thoughts, then we'll come to Switzerland. Okay. Allow it, the microphone is yours. Hello. Hello. Okay, so my name is Foster Chamama here in Malawi, at Agabu. So as of now, how to rebuild Ukraine, we are answering that question. So first, we need to start with a relief. Means we need to start with a relief, but based on that relief, uh, we are going to look at it physically. So physically, we need to provide them with food through organization, 
e.g. WFP. As you can see, WFP provide people with the food, as I have already said, that the WFP or the food program. Yeah, and the, uh, another one, we need to look at the medical care. Medical care as well as the water supply and the other life saving activities. Yeah, another question is what would you look for? So our target is we are looking for the restoration of broken things there in Ukraine. Yeah. For instance, maybe schools, uh, hospitals, any infra, infra, different infrastructures is what you are looking for. That's OK. OK. Um, if possible, please, can you turn on your camera when you speak? I'm not getting you. The camera should be on as you're speaking so that we can see your face. Yes. All right. Yay! Yes. You finish now, yeah? <laughs> Good. All right. So are you done, Malawi? We are done, sir. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a good, uh, good attempt. I think uh, I would say yes. Relief is important. Uh, you could give them something, but uh, I think I will just comment together the overall comment after Abuja and and Iban because it's a similar situation, so that we can move on. Is that okay? Yeah, Abuja or Ibada. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Okay, my name is Fumilayo Gray. Um, from Ibada. So concerning the question about how to build Ukraine due to their current economy. What we have to do is we leave. We go there physically. Find people there physically, just like missionaries, that can now bring solutions to their problems, giving them relief materials, maybe somehow giving them uh, money, something that will help them reduce all their waste safety that would and also like food, the basic needs that they need at that particular time. And also praying with them, teaching them how to come together in unity again in order to rebuild their nation. And from this, they begin to learn and they begin to come together because presently we know that they are scattered. So they begin to come together as they hear the teaching and they are also, the armies are also being led. And um, there are some things that thank you. Thank you. Abuja, you want to add something? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, from what you have uh, taught us about relief and development, um, a place like Gaza um, is uh, uh, a plane in the in the class, and also uh, this is supposed to be a place for rehabilitation, for rehabilitation and rehabilitating the people. And just like we have learned, biblical development is perfect, and I feel that in the place of rehabilitation, that's where um, they can receive healing and also be able to. Uh, learn about God and his, uh, his ways, that is the biblical values. And then we move to uh, development in such a way that they can receive a long-term uh, economic improvement and also socially, politically, and every uh, sphere of, um, of, uh, of life. So that's just what I want to add, basically. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for, for your contribution, Malawi, Abuja, and the Ibada. That is valid points, what you have said. I just want to add the things that you didn't uh, consider uh, in your answers. Number one is the issue when you are bringing, you talk about relief, uh, uh, rehabilitation and development. You did not mention the issue of the war because we still have ongoing conflict in Ukraine and uh, in Gaza. How would you make sure that development happen in that situation with, without stopping the war first? Because if you say you want to rebuild broken things, the bombs are still going on. So is that sustainable according to what we have learned? So I think the first thing to, to consider as development workers is how do you stop the war? How do you facilitate these two rivals, two parts, who are still fighting to come to at least a certain agreement that then you can uh, you can you can continue with uh, your development project. Yes, relief you always give even in times of conflict. You're right on that one. But for development, because this is our topic we are discussing about sustainable development, you need to think of the ways on how to stop the fight. And that can happen through diplomacy, okay? Building a diplomatic team which can try to bring uh, this party, two parties on the table to talk. That's what you can see even now it's happening in Gaza uh, when it comes to hostage uh, hostage situation. The way forward that they do is Qatar, Egypt, and they're trying to discuss that is diplomatic effort, you know. So that's how you 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 you, you go about it in your communities or in your villages or in the nations. The first thing when there is a conflict, you need to find ways through diplomatic effort how to stop it, because you cannot talk of development if these things continue. Are we together? So I think that's, uh, that's, that's I yeah, so that's the point that I really wanted to stress, that uh, whenever you talk about uh, development, the first thing is to stop the bleeding, like what you have seen in the story, okay, of the Good Samaritan. So how would you stop the bleeding when people, they're still fighting is to try to negotiate to come to uh, to peace okay so that's the the thing and now because you are not in that position that you can go to gather and ukraine physically or to russia to talk with putin you can pray okay in your location each location you can pray that god raises people who can go uh, and they can have breakthrough in diplomatic discussion so that you can stop and then we can start talking about for rebuilding these countries. Are you together? Yeah, so now let's come to Switzerland about uh, the exercise that we have. Jesus as our model of development and uh, it will give us a big picture now with all the scenarios that we have. As uh, the Swiss uh, here, the class from Switzerland is educating us uh, the, the situation of Jesus. The microphone is yours. So my name is Catherine. I will lead you to the questions. What was the political situation during Jesus' time? So the Romans were ruling. There was a system they need to pay taxes. And they had re reduced um, rights. What was the, the religious situation? There were um, teachers like the Pharisees and Sadducees, and there was the temple, so um, you needed to address the religion people to um, get your sin forgiven. And what was Jesus' family situation? So uh, we think Jesus was coming from a poor family because um, they uh, paid 
when they went to the temple for to pay uh, for uh, when the baby was born, they uh, brought a dog. So that is, if you don't have the money for another animal, that's the lowest, uh, the cheapest one you can bring. And also they went for two years to Egypt. So yeah, we think they, they had no money, not much money after that. And in the family, the sisters and brothers, they did not believe him that he's the son of God. So yeah, it was also tension there. And we think he had a good relationship to the mother because she was always there in difficult situations. Yeah, thank you. Big hand for all locations. So you can see this exercise is uh, summing up our development efforts, like with the scenarios that we had in Ukraine and uh, Gaza, and now looking at our model of development, Jesus. Okay. So now the point with this ex exercise was that uh, Jesus was not in a perfect environment. Okay. But yet the scripture is telling us that he developed, he grew. Okay, the political situation during Jesus' time was not ideal. It was not perfect. Uh, there was a, a luring power, which was luring uh, the, the area that Jesus was living, and tax, you know, not fair tax, but yet Jesus managed to grow, to grow. Are we together? The political system was not fair. Yeah? It was this, always these conflicts between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the debate, and or it was not a healthy uh, religious system. But yet, it says Jesus developed. Okay, the family situation of Jesus was not ideal. It was poor family, like what you have ex uh, explained. Poor, you know, tensions. They didn't believe him, but yet. It, tell, it tells us that Jesus developed. So the point I want to develop home here is that no matter how horrible, how difficult your environment you're working as a, as, as a community development worker, no matter how hard it is, you can still grow and you can still develop. Because Jesus, as our model of growth, because everybody, when we pray, we say we look at to Jesus as our example. That's what we say as Christians. Jesus is our chief example. But we see that his situation was not easy. It was not an easy situation. So there are some people out there, they said, I'll wait until there's a perfect time that I can do things. I just want to put this challenge that there will not going to be a perfect time to do something. The perfect time is now. In that difficult situation, no matter what your situation is like, you can still grow. Jesus had to go, has to maneuver through this unjust political system to grow. He had to maneuver through this uh, not perfect religious system to grow. He had to maneuver through family problems to grow, to become our model. So you can still bring development in your nation, in your community, in your country, don't wait for a perfect time. That maybe when we have a good president in Malawi or in Abuja, when we things will change, or Ibada or wherever you are coming from here, that whenever the the the, the, the conditions are right, will will develop. It's not like that. It's not that case. There have never been uh, there have never been a, a time whereby you, you can say that it's totally peace. You know. Since the time that we had recorded history, uh, we had uh, three. We have over three thousand years of recorded history from you know where we have the history of wars of fighting. Do you know how uh, how, how many years was uh, peaceful out of this three thousand plus history of of wars? Of You're going to see it's only it's only two hundred ninety-eight something years that we had peace. There have been always conflict, there have been always trouble, there have been always issues, but yet civilization is developing. So don't sit down there and wait for a perfect time. 
That's my development message. Go and do something. Take actions, you know, because even Jesus, our model, as our example for salvation, he did not have perfect conditions around his life, but yet he developed. So you can develop as an individual person, you can develop as a community, as a family, as a nation, you can develop. Try to go around the political jargons, the religious uh, deception, you know, the family problems, develop and become a blessing to someone. So that's what I wanted to, to, to say with uh, these examples and scenario, that no matter how hard it is, you can still develop. That's national building. The School of Biblical Christian Worldview encourages national building. We are not running away from trouble. We are not running away, flying somewhere to heaven and sing hymns with the angels. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are here on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? We are here to bring God's kingdom in here and now that Jesus can build his tent here and now. Okay? So uh, I'm starting to winding up now. We'll finish with environmental stewardship, taking care of the resources. Uh, and what is environment stewardship? The environmental stewardship is talking about the ecology, which is the air, how we manage the air, the water, the minerals, and all the organisms surrounding, you know, affecting in a given uh, um, organism. You know, these things, the air, the water, the minerals, they can affect us as human beings if we don't take care of them, okay? So we need to manage them. We need to take care of these resources to make life possible. So stewardship is the other word of management. The Christians, they always call this, you know, stewardship, while secular people, they say management, okay? But it's something, okay? Management of resources, that's stewardship. So when we talk about environmental stewardship, we are talking about how we can manage the resources. I would wanted to show you a video, but uh, we will not, because I'll, I'll send this PowerPoint. So when you have this PowerPoint, you can put it there, you watch that video if you in time. Okay? So we will continue about the idea for stewardship of resources. We want to help communities to become entrepreneurs, people who start something not just waiting for the government or looking for opportunity that I want to, I want a job. If they don't have a job and they're just sitting, entrepreneurs, they, they have the ability. It is the ability and readiness to develop, organize and run a business enterprise. Knowing God as the first entrepreneur, the creation story in Genesis chapter one, think of that. God is the first entrepreneur, the first starter of everything. He started all that we are seeing out of nothing, okay? Out of nothing, as the greatest entrepreneur, he start. So we can also start. We are to help communities to know their resources and steward the resources, take care of the, these resources, and then de develop something, start something that will, will, will create job, something that can alleviate poverty, something that it can empower families, so the advantage of being an entrepreneur is that you create job. Where people that say there's no job, you create job. So you are you are effectively using the resources in the right way. There is a innovation and you solve problems. I can give an example, a quick example. When we started with our project extending home a uh, long time ago, I, I was not having a job, you know just a missionary but now we are talking of over 50 plus work, people who are working they get salary they help support their family there are even many more people who are having short-term benefits from that so what is that job creation effective use of resources there is innovation and we are solving problems of many people you know, people who are sick they'll come to our facility they get treated their problems solved so thousands of people they're getting uh empowered because I choose to become an entrepreneur. Are we together? 
So I, don't, I wonder what God will do with your life if you say, I want to, to start something that will bless many people. So, so that's, my, that's my encouragement to you. Um, so I want to, to come to the welfare system, government welfare versus private responsibility, okay? Government welfare system, because there are many people who are just waiting for government to help them uh, while they have free resources and all of this. But if you are, uh, but if you understand what I'm saying, we want to see that the first thing for these people, where you go to bring development, you need to check on their worldview, how they manage the resources. Remember, you know, find out where they are. How do they see the world? How do they take uh, uh, responsibility as individuals? That's individual. We're going back to that, that house. The worldview of the people matter. Number two, the second pillar is uh, 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 you look at the church, the needs uh, for the church. The church needs to take responsibility to educate families, to educate the people so that they can be strong. Okay? If the church, the church is strong, uh, and the families they are strong, and the individuals they are strong, then we can bring transformation, development, or sustainable development. What is the difference between just development and sustainable development? Here is a little difference, okay? Uh, you have heard maybe a term that they say in development, they say, if you give a fish to people, they will eat one day and they'll be hungry, okay? That's relief. And they say in development, you teach them how to fish, okay? And they say you feed them for life. But for sustainability, we add one component to this story. We say if you give a fish to a, pers to a person or family, you feed them for them. If you teach them how to fish, they'll deplete, they'll finish the fishes in the ocean. Because what they know is just to fish. But then we add a sustainability comp component, which is, but you teach them how to raise their own fish, okay? Because a farmer knows when to harvest the fish. When the fish, they have eggs, they want to produce young ones, he's not going to fish that time. But if you just teach them how to fish, they don't care about that. They'll finish all the fish in the waters. So the world view of the people matters for sustainable development. Number two, the church needs to take responsibility to teach the families that the, the families can be empowered. Is how we can have uh, uh, transformation or sustainable development. So I want to give this uh, example from uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 8. I want somebody to read verse number 4 and 5 to look at the importance of family in development, you know, importance of family in sustainable development. Can somebody read 1 Samuel chapter number 8, verse number 4? and five. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Okay, you have heard the story here. I didn't take the whole story, but I wanted you to show you the importance of family. This is the greatest prophet, Sam, you know, that he has not, he has given the first kings of Israel, two kings. Okay? He was a powerful man. When he prayed, it could thunder. He could say, I pray today, the rain will come, and it will happen that it was not, it was not just, a, <laughs> he was anointed, this man. But now, you see the situation here. The elders of Israel, they're coming to him when he was old. They say, look, Sam, you are old. But your family, you understand, your own children, they do not, they do not walk in your ways. Then give us a king. You see the reason in there, you know. The family has a problem. And because of Samuel's failure in his family, it's affecting the whole nation that now the the, the, the Israelites, they're coming and say, we want a king. So sometimes we 
always, I've heard some preaching, they always blame the people, you know, blame the people. Why did they want a king? God was their king, okay? You, some of you have heard that preaching. God was their king, but they wanted another king. But yeah, it's, it's true, God was their king. But here, the reasoning of the people say, you are children, they are not walking in your ways. So they were just fed up with the, these children of Samuel. Okay, they were not behaving, you know, they were like, they were taking, sacrificing the temple, there was corruption, there were all these things that was going on. Therefore, the people say it's enough with these children of Samuel. We cannot continue on this. We need something different. So family is the cornerstone for development. It's, it can impact many things. What was the challenge of Samuel? Probably he used to travel long distance from Rama to Gilgal huh? as a judge. Yeah? He had this distance. He has to take either on a horse or what. Do you think when he could come from there, he will have time, quality time with his family, his children? No, he's tired. He's tired. No time to decide properly his children. And later, it has an impact on, on the nation of Israel that now they want a king because of the failure of our families. So if we want to bring sustainable development, let's focus on empowering the family. The fathers take responsibility. Be there for your children. Be there for your kids to disciple them so that whenever they grow, they cannot depart from this one. So we have a good example from Samuel as the great prophet, but there was a problem in his family because they could not walk in his way. And it impacted Israel later to become to ask for king, not God. The reason his family was broken. Right together? Importance of family. So when we go to community development, let's focus on building the family. And then on the top of the pyramid, we had business management. So I'm not going to go in detail of that. What is a business you have already ran in this school? And how do you start a business and how do you maintain it? But uh, the purpose of uh, all this, what we want to do is to help the poor and the powerless. Okay? Whatever the priv privilege that God has given unto us, either business or the resource, the things that God has given unto us is for the poor and the powerless. That's a scripture you can read. And uh, I want to finish with this pyramid, creation pyramid, to, to, to go back to the, to the, very, to the Genesis space. To, you remember the way I started this lecture? I want to finish with, with that now. I started with the scripture. That was Second Peter. Remember? And uh, that sec Second Peter, uh, Peter was saying, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And I said, you have to take notice of those words, life and godliness. Then I said, there are things that makes life possible. And there are things that make you godly. And many are the times that we have just focus on the things that makes us godly. But the things that us makes us life is the things that Peter was quoting from Genesis 1. So you see, if you read Genesis 1 up to 26, you're going to see there's a creation pyramid. There is, a, there is order and design in creation. Things that were not just random. God made sure that the first things they are first. Okay? So when you read Genesis 1, you're going to see, you're going to see that on that pyramid, the first things they are air, soil, and water. That's the first things that God made established. And then you're going to see the second level, he created animals and plants. Okay? And then finally, man was the last. Okay? So I always have a, a experience, sorry, I'll run away from the camera. So the Swiss will just try, one person will try for this experiment, and then you, yeah, and then you, then you, 
Then we can conclude. Okay, so I do here. Okay, I do here. So that's our pyramid. I want somebody from, from the class try to take one thing out of the pyramid. See, we see if human beings can, can survive on top. Who is he willing to do that for us? Just stand up. Yeah, you, 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 you have to be careful. Don't kill that human, OK? <laughs> no. Yeah? Yeah. I can take it just a human. No, you don't yeah. have to take that human because it's a, God made humans to be steward. <laughs> that is impossible. Yeah, just try. You can try. You can try. <laughs> try. Be careful. Don't, don't kill him. <laughs> but I can move the boat. Yeah, yeah. the boat. Yes. Take one. You, you know, you don't have to support, you don't have to manipulate, you just one take hand. one. One hand. One? Yeah. You only touch the one you want yeah. to take it it's, out. It's, it's manipulating. Okay. Try. You're manipulating it. You don't have to push the other one. <laughs> I don't. I don't have to push this one. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. No, no, you touch them. You only touch the one you want to pull out. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> So we have seen what happened here, okay? Uh, that's the creation pyramid, okay? These are the things that makes life possible. So when you take one or you mess up with something, you are harming the humans, are we together? But what do we do when it comes to stewardship? We pollute the air, we make the soil not fertile enough, we make the, clean, the, the, the water not clean, we kill all the animals, some animals, and we cut down the plants. And then humans has problem, okay? So we have airborne disease, we have you know, water problems, all the statistics that I've given you, most of them, they are in, in, from environmental stewardship, environmental related. So that's what Peter is saying, that these are the things that makes life possible. But if you're good Christians, you don't take care of this, but if some people get sick in your church or in my church, you go and you pray for them. You don't check about the water or the air, you know. You know, sometimes people, God loves, you know? because if it's a water problem, you are praying, oh God, heal this person. God says, shut up, check the water, the, the, the quality of the water, you know. So that's, that's the thing that we need to take care of these resources. If we take care of these resources, we're going to bring sustainable development. Because God has made sure that the first thing, they should be first. If I could talk about business development, is there any business that you can do, or people that are doing in your country or elsewhere, that doesn't, doesn't involve the water, the air, the soil, or the animals or plants. Is there any business that I can do? Even if you say IT or cyberspace, they still need an office. You still need a soil to do that. Okay? So these are the foundation that support life. And let's as Christians be at the first forefront to take care of these resources that God has given to us. And then we will make life possible. Okay, I think uh, that's uh, the end. If we take care of uh, these uh, resources, and you can see the development goals that even the secular, you know, UN have. You can just say they say they want no poverty in the family, zero hunger. Okay, they need good health. It has to do with all these resources we're talking about, right? Okay. Zero, uh, good, uh, good help. 
quality education. Remember, we're coming back to the thing. Gender equality, that's uh, something we need to say. And they say clean water, you see, from the pyramid, which is that we're talking about. Right? We're talking mm -hmm. affordable, clean energy, you know, that's air energy, you know, wind, you know, sun, and all those things coming from that, you know, decent work and the economic growth, you know, it's coming from all these things that we do. You know? yeah. uh, industry and the what, what there. Uh -huh. Access to me medical care, yeah, in parties, sustainable cities yeah, and communities, you know, responsible construction. We talked about that climate action, yeah, life below water, yeah, life on land, peace and justice, strong institution, you know, partnership for the goals. You see, so all this they're coming from how we manage of our resources. When we manage our resources well, we take care of this creation pyramid, we will come to this 20, uh, they say 2030 agenda. This is a 2030 agenda, okay, from the UN. By 2030, they want these things to happen. But if we don't take care of this creation pyramid, it's difficult to reach this goal. How do they So that's, uh, that's the end of uh, my lecture. I hope it was helpful. I hope you have taken something. I'll be available for answers. You can get my email and what you can talk more if there's something because I didn't give everything. Yeah, but.